Well, hey there, guys. Welcome to Module 3, which is exploring the 3D animation process. And just like we did before with working with the different uh, heavy and light animated ball rig, this is actually a little bit more advanced ball rig here now. This is actually called the squirrel tail, or tail balls, it's often called. And we're going to be getting into this um, in terms of looking at the rig and, of course, not just understanding how to animate now, not just a ball with squash and stretch properties, rotate and translate properties, but now the added element of an appendage. In this case, it's just a tail. This is a nice little precursor before we actually get into, say, working with legs. What a lot of this is going to teach you, besides just keyframing and timing and pacing and movement throughout the, uh, the scene, or the obstacle course in this case, is understanding uh, additional principles of animation such as follow through and providing the illusion of weight. So just like we did with the ball squashing, stretching, performing based upon the weight or the material of that ball, when we start to introduce an appendage like a tail or even arms. Just think of it almost like a ponytail on the end of a ball. It's basically what this is going to be doing. Now, if you look on through here, I provide again some examples uh, from uh, quarters past of some students' projects versions of this. Brief example of what this description is here. Again, it's the obstacle course, course uh, and your ball's performance, your squirrel tail ball uh, getting through. You can look here, of course. You know, we can go ahead and download not just the tailed ball MB file, but also download the obstacle course. And I've provided some pre existing animation uh, little tutorials. These are just video links to other YouTube sources and so on that deals with how to actually work with this tail ball besides what I'll just talk about here today with you in this video. All right, so jumping over into Maya just to see what we've got uh, in this content. Close that down. Remember our basic setup here. Now again, we may have to revise the timeline to a longer or shorter one. We know make sure that our little running man or the playback speed in the time slider is set to 24 frames per second and set to 24 frames per second by one, which is real time, okay? That is playing 24 frames per second. Hit save, and then don't forget to go project window, new project, okay? We can give this, uh, maybe I'll just call this obstacle project and give it its proper new project folder destination. So let's see, let's go to 32. Squirrel ball obstacle, hit select, and there we basically now hit accept, and we've set our project. Now, don't forget though, go to those two things we downloaded, the tailed ball and the obstacle course, select them, and place them now into the proper project folder, obstacle project. And remember, these can either go into assets or these can go into scenes. I'm just going to put it into scenes just because really the obstacle course is the scene. Okay, now to get things going here, let's first look at the obstacle course. Oops. So I'm just going to go to File, Open Scene, choose the obstacle. I could also import this into my scene, but the cool part is, is that bringing in the obstacle scene is going to, and opening that file is not only going to give us the obstacle, but also give us the squirrel ball already in it. Okay, let's just double check to make sure 24 frames. Yes, everything's still good here. All right, let me go ahead and turn on my wireframe so we can see what we're looking at here. So you can basically see here what we've got is a 300 frame scene file of this obstacle course. So it's kind of very, you know, Mario here where we even have a little flag to get to in the end. If I hit play, you're going to see what entails in this obstacle course. So it's a little more complicated. It's now we're dealing with uh, having to match the keyframe and match the location to timing with whether it's the little or how much time we even spend. Do we want to even stop on one of these little uh, elevators or one of these little moving up mechanisms? Obviously, do we want to jump over and onto very rapidly? Are we going to time and pace this movement in 300 frames? Remember, you can always add more frames. Um, when we get to this little, you know, are we going to duck under? Or are we going to jump over? You know, and then in order to, because we're not really rolling our, our ball this time, right? We're actually making him bounce along. How is it going to get to the end and pace out and so on? Let's hit some pauses. All right, 
So let's take a look at what the squirrel ball is. All right. Now this is also something you can see, which is very interesting here. As you'll notice, if I, if I select or try to select our obstacle course, it is currently locked in its layer. You see how it's got the R here so we don't accidentally, you know, it's locked as a reference layer. And that's a good way to understand that when we go to grab our character, we're only going to be able to select the character here and not have to fight with, you know, selecting the actual set or scene. Now, you can see here, just showing you uh, just a little rundown of what we're dealing with. We've got squash and stretch on our little squirrel ball again. And that is, of course, being able to only move in the Y direction. You see over here, it's locked to only having a Y attribute. And if I hit rotation, you see it gives me no rotation capabilities, only translate Y. Now, the ball controller here, you can see, is fully rotational as well as translatable in the X, Y, Z, and you see it's actually zeroed out. Now, just a quick remember, guys, if you ever get lost in trying it back to zero, you can actually go to the channel box over here and just zero it out. You also notice there's no scale capability for that because, again, it is not one of the options available. If I select the main locator here, you see that there are elements here that can actually control its distance in X, Y, and Z, which is why, again, if I were to highlight this and hit zero, it would put it to the zero coordinate in the middle of, this, of the screen. You also see it's been rotated at negative 90 degrees on the Y to get to this new location. And lastly, you see controllers here for the tail itself. See this? And so each of these little, you can almost think of bones that make up this tail, has its own locator system. But you see, it only gives me rotate and scale. So if you can see where I can scale that to make more squash and stretch. Okay, in that direction only in the Z. But mostly it's for rotation. See? to create the shape of what that tail would be doing. Now, I recommend if you really want to understand how tails move, you know, watch uh, a woman's ponytail, or again, anybody's ponytail, shoot, I have a ponytail. But watch a ponytail bounce and how it actually has different pacing and weight than what the main head or the body of this sphere, for example, is doing. So there's things called lag, okay? That's where a body that goes up Things that have weight externally from that body tend to go down. And when a heavy body that controls the parent goes down, those that have weight typically go up. So if we're going to be making a bouncing ball bouncing throughout this obstacle course, a great way to think about that issue or what's going on there is that, well, we need it to perform so that when the ball is taking off and in going up into the air, the tail is lagging and stays down. When the ball then goes and reaches its apex and starts to come back down to earth, that ponytail is gonna fly up into the air and stay up there longer. So you are going to get this, you know, this cause and effect. And that is what this whole principle of timing and weights and things falling on curves and many of these additional animation principles kind of deal with here. You can see here we've got you know, controllers for the tail shape here. So we have to think about, in a way like we did the bouncing heavy and light ball, where you got to think about not just what the main object or the main character is, which is the ball. We then have to go back and add follow through animation to the appendage, the tail. And again, this is going to apply to things like how we animate a hand versus the arm or how a foot gets animated versus a leg. You know, when it comes to, you know, movement and bounce and all this squash and stretch and weight. All right. So let me go ahead here. I've kind of got this little perspective window here. And I'm just going to hit my space bar. Oh, okay. It doesn't look like it's got the default four panel. So I'm just going to switch this to an orthographic. Let's see. Panels. Uh, layouts. And I want to do a four panel. Oh, and that's now giving me, of course, that my outliner. Here it is right here, which we can use if we want to. Or remember, we can always switch this to the orthographic that is not visible, which would be, in 
this case, I could put the orthographic of a top camera on here. Nope, not this one here is top. So I need front, so this one would be side. That's what it would be. Orthographic, side. Let's go ahead and say six, 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 six for all of our layers. Go ahead and just move this out here so we can see. What this, so you see here the side is actually looking at the finish line from the POV of the finish line. Here at the top, you can see how it's moving so we can control it as it's navigating throughout the obstacle course. And here in the front, we can actually control the left to right performance of this. All right, so a great thing to kind of think about here again is don't necessarily begin at zero. Let's give it a second, at least 30 frames, or I should say 24 frames or something, before we actually do anything. So we have time to actually see this squirrel ball, whatever you want to call it, actually have a moment of thought process before it actually attempts uh, the obstacle course. Okay. In fact, this might even be a, a new introduction because this side is kind of a wasted camera. See how it's kind of a wasted camera? Watch what I'm going to do with this perspective view here. Actually, let's go ahead and put this one to a mimic of that perspective view. Okay? This is going to be pretty cool. And they do this a lot with character animation where you'll actually create a facial camera that actually follows the character everywhere it's go. And it allows you to always have access to a good angle view. Okay? So let's do this. Watch what we're going to do here. I'm going to create a camera, okay? And I could do a camera name. I could do a camera, just a blank camera here. Let's just create a blank camera. And I'm going to call this follow camera, okay? Just call it follow camera. And what I'm going to do with this follow camera is I'm going to hold shift, select the main ring here of our character, and hit parent. Okay, so what we're doing is we're creating a custom camera called follow camera that regardless of what our animated camera, which we can change the word perspective to like main shot camera if we wish later, but just remember that's what we're going to use it for. I can come back up here now and choose panel follow camera. Now you'll notice here, we hit spacebar. I don't know where this camera is, and it's because it created that camera at the default of zero, zero. So all I'm doing is navigating my camera now, my follow camera, so that I can see what this looks like on a better way of kind of, you know, just like that. Okay, let me go ahead and turn the wire frame. Okay. So why did I create a follow camera? I created a follow camera because if I eventually go and move this, you see the camera, which is called follow camera, is following my ball, my squirrel ball. And that's really important because that will allow me, of course, to now not necessarily have to judge what my perspective camera is. And let's just go to our perspective camera for a second. Just hit space bar. And don't forget, the good thing to do here is do a camera settings and turn on your resolution gate so you can see what is physically in your camera settings. We can even come here temporarily. Oops, not render. I meant to hit render options if I want to set it up in here. And just change this to being the proper 1920 1080, which is HD 1080. Okay. And close. And now what I can do here is I can actually animate my camera very easily to now be not just following the ball, but following the action. So it's kind of like, again, it's imagine that your perspective camera we're gonna use, which again, I can always come over and name it something else. But the camera, uh, perspective camera, is going to be our video camera, whereas the follow cam is just going to follow the ball, the squirrel ball, throughout the entire timeline so that we have one camera that isn't necessarily, because the last thing you want to do is move your rendered camera a lot, OK? 
Okay, so we don't want it bouncing up and down and moving around a lot. We want one smooth transition. Okay, and what I'm going to do here, watch this, is I'm going to select my camera. Let's see. I guess I have to go into my outliner temporarily here. There. Choose my perspective camera. Okay, and you see I've got all these parameters here to key. I've got my auto key on right now, and I'm going to start here again, like I said, at frame 24, and I'm just going to hit the S key. And what that does is that sets a key for every single parameter, visibility, scale, for this camera, okay? Now, again, it would be a little different here if I chose the aim camera, because that gives me not just a camera to animate, but a target aimer. So this is just regular camera. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go all the way down, close to the end of my shot here. And I'm just going to navigate with the auto key on. See, there's my follow camera until I get to a shot that basically entitles the ending, just like that. I can even zoom in a little bit if I wish here. And what that's doing, guys, is that's auto keying the movement of that camera over time, see? So now I have an actual film camera style of, and that's going to control the timing and pacing of my, my scroll ball getting through the obstacle course. You know, and I kind of like here where maybe I'll just zoom out a little bit more right here in the middle. See that? So when I do jumps, I can actually see the jump. It's going a little quick. Obviously, if I'm going to be jump, 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 that might be a little quick here. So maybe I'll just go back a little with this. So here now I have, and again, you want to change it to a different, we can call this renderable camera, or you can call it actual shot. Oh, it looks like it doesn't let me change it. Okay. Well, it doesn't let me change the name, but let's see what this performance will look like in real time, just by the camera moving. And there you have it. Okay, so that is now going to control the timing and the pacing for me to get from the starting line to the end with enough, even here at the end where it stops moving, and that's where I could probably go hop, 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 hop at the very end, or jump up and down at the end or whatever. But now I have physical movement. Now, the reason why I animated this perspective camera to be my renderable camera, and then I also have that other view Right, right here, which is the follow cam, is because I never want to be in my perspective view and move and zoom in because of my auto key. If you do it, you'll forget, and then your camera will be flying all over the place, setting keys all over the place. Okay, so we don't really want to use this perspective anymore. This is what we see when we want to see the final performance, or what it would look like, or where it needs to be where in time only but we never ever move that camera. In fact, we can even take that camera and put it into reference only so it never ever accidentally moves. All right, let's hit pause and rewind. All right, so you see now what I've got, right? I've got top down, I got a front view, which is going from left to right. I have my follow camera and I have the camera that will eventually be renderable or well, do my play blast in, or whatever it happens to be. Okay, so let's come over here, let's grab my, my controller, left, right, and otherwise. I know I'm starting here at about 24, so I'm just gonna use this to control the translate X, Y, and Z too. Why not, let's key that. Let's see if this actually works properly. Okay, auto keyer is on. I'm now going to give it some time, and again, I'm using this view here, okay, to control getting from there, whoops, Boy, that's crazy, I'm just going to use that to get him to that edge, let's see, did that animate, no, that didn't animate, all right, so, 
with this, we ran into that same problem there. So let me go ahead and just break these connections right down. Break selected. Oops. Break connection to turn off those keys. So you see how they're grayed out there? I should have known that because that was the same thing with our heavy and light uh, balls, is that this is not keyable. I could probably group it and do it, but it just doesn't want us to key it. So we're just going to go like we did with the good old heavy and light balls here. Okay, you can even see my follow camera here in this shot. And what I'm going to do here at 24, I'm going to start at 24. Let's we'll just go ahead and I'll just key select it. Okay. And then I have to think about how many frames is it going to take me to get to the end. We'll say maybe one full second, which would be 48. Go, and we'll, that'll get him to end here. All right. And now I might want to think here about, okay, I've got it. You see in my top view, there's no platform directly in front. So maybe right here at this key, I want to pick a side. So I'll just give it a little movement towards that platform. Okay, let's move forward now. Now, I'm moving forward here because I'm trying to get an idea of when this far platform, which is down here, is actually up. Which should be about there, okay? So let's move them to that platform. Like so. Problem is, you see here, which way is that platform going? All right, so he actually hits it, but you're going to see in a few frames, he actually needs to go down to follow it. Okay. Now you notice I'm not doing anything here in terms of rotation, just doing location of things. Okay, so you can see now, of course, here, what's he need to be? He needs to be in his apex of bounce. Same things if I go back here in between point A to point B here. off the ground and again so we're going to start looking at not just the top not just the side but also again our follow cameras and perspective now to see how he's going to go oh see this is where we have to go back and make sure we choose the proper keys i don't know if you notice that but if you select in the center it allows you to go in the two axes that are available in that shot Now remember, we're going to have to go back and change this to have a little bit more squash stretch and follow through. That could be something as simple as just copying that key and holding for a single frame or a single beat. Remember, we can always do that by simply selecting the key, going one forward or one back, and pasting a key. That basically doubled that key, which acts as a single beat hold. Okay, before it then goes here. Okay, so again, even here, what I'll do, copy, go back a frame, paste. Like I said, we might have to do just a little, even when we paste, we might have to do a little bit to make it looks like it's landed on that platform. See? Go a little bit further here. Now it needs to be about here. I'll go dead center. I'll have it move over a little bit of left. Whoops, too much left. Okay. Come on. So, 
That gives me two key points. Remember here too, I could also just go ahead and copy that key, go one frame forward, and paste that key to get, again, a single double beat of that key. So it stays put for two frames. That allows me now to go back halfway here and figure out, all right, well, maybe about there. I'll move it over just a little bit halfway between the platform that's moving and the next beat. But you see here now, because I'm moving this way now, I need him to be there. Let's go frame forward. That looks good. Go a frame forward. Still needs to be back a little bit. Okay. So we're just going to keep going here and keep going. This means now he can go to that location of that platform. Let's center up all of our spaces here. It looks pretty good there. All right, so he's made his second position here. Don't forget. Move everything a little bit. Copy that key. I'm actually going to go back one and paste it. Scrub through. Okay. So now he's made it to this key, this platform here. Now, the problem with this platform is it is going front and back. So he's going to have to ride it back and then ride it forward for a little bit here. Okay. So I'll use this panel here. Should we get our circle back again? Just scrub through a few frames. You see now it's all the way back. No movement here, just riding. See, and you can even see where you might need to do just a little bit of centering up, trying to fit, make it sit on that, make it look like it's riding back. So he's still sitting on that platform right there. Now, it helps you kind of sometimes, because you see it automatically set a key here. I might have to actually select these two guys, and you know what? Key there as well. Because I only moved it in one direction, which means if I don't set the keys for the X, Y, and Z at this point, the next move when I go to jump would just simply jump across. See? Almost wants me to do that here too. Do that. And there too. See, so we're X, Y, and Z. Okay. Planning it on there so it actually stays in its position. There's a little bit. You can see where there's a little bit of movement there where I'm just a little bit off. And we don't really want that sliding around there. Be selected. All right. So we're riding it along. You can see here where there's still other places where it looks like it's just kind of sliding. Now, a lot of this will make more sense too, guys, when we actually get to the um, curve. And then we can start to clean up curves. We can smooth the curves out when we go to the animation graph editor just to see exactly what this is doing over time. You know, see the visible, because this, when we look at this in the curve editor, only the uh, X axis should have any movement. Everything else should be flat and, and locked in. Okay, so there he's going. Let's do this. I'm going to go ahead and from there, remember, we're going to have to do some squash and stretch. Let's get him to... next platform, which should be here. Okay. Key that 
that selection. Even here, if I want to just put a pause, copy that key, go one frame forward, and paste. Go back into the middle here, and let's give him some actual height. Right? Actual height. Okay. Just like that. I'm actually going to do this too. I'm actually going to, because he's going to have some thinking going on here, right? Let's go ahead and actually do some thinking here. Let's do a copy key. We'll give it about a second and a half of thought process here. Let's go ahead and paste those. Okay. So I have him just sitting there where I could just have him kind of bouncing or have time to animate that tail. Okay. And now we're going to figure out how on earth we're going to jump and land on this rotationary device here, right? Well, it looks like he should almost quickly jump here, huh? Let's take him there. Right? Got all three X, Y, Z's there. Let's go up in the middle. Let's give them some height. And this is where it can actually get kind of complicated here because he's now, just like he had to ride that last kind of move, moving little level there that was going forward and back, now he's got to ride this in as it rotates around. Don't worry about the rotation. We'll worry about the rotation when we actually get to that point. So he's there, and this might be a good point here. I'm actually going to use the top-down version here. Let me go ahead and let wireframe unshaded. This may be... kind of see it better there. Let's just do that. All right. Because now I need to kind of say, all right, well, if he's there at that point, he's following an arc, so he's going to be there at that point. Go. And again, don't forget to key that extra Y. Right? Because I need to make him look like he is literally just sitting still in that same spot. This is where sometimes having the auto key is not as helpful. because it's almost better to just highlight these, key them, and then move it where it needs to be. Trying to get him to stay put in that spot. Let's get all the way through and make some make up some distance. There, Need that Y again. Okay. Just nudge. And then jump some time. Okay. To put them here on the end of the ramp. Space bar out. Let's see where he is in relation to that ramp now. Okay. 
And now it's just the bouncing ball to the finish line, right? Just double check. Oh, we forgot to give him Y. Okay, let's give him some movement Y. And this is where he's just gonna you can say, what is that key at 219? Uh, let's say 219, I'm just gonna space these out. Let's say about here. Remember, you use your orthographic, your top-down views and everything to get it right. That looks good. Copy that because that's going to be a beat where he actually has to squash and stretch. So we're just going to put an extra key there. Go in the middle. Let's give him a little bit of Y direction. Like I should have probably copied this key here, right? Let's go ahead and copy that. And paste. Bing bing. About there. Line them up. Okay. Copy that key. Now you can see I could get one key, two key, three keys. That just allows me more squash and more animated tail movement there. So it isn't just a, a quick whip. And this is also where when we start to introduce things like motion blur can really do some amazingly cool stuff. Okay, and so I'm here at the end. I'm running out of time right now. So let's just see. Where else does he have to go? Let's go ahead here. Line it up here. Copy that key. Paste that key. And now to the finish line. And again, what you do here, guys, is up to you. You can go bing, bing, bing. You can go for the big jump here. You don't have to hit every single step. Or what if I, hey, this is neat. What if I just say, hey, jump that and go right to the flagpole. So he's all the way down the flagpole. then I have to do quite a large leap here. Quite a large leap to jump over the steps. All right, so we can go back in time here and see just the X, Y movements right now of our ball, or I could go to the perspective view, which remember will be the eventual render. But remember, turn off your auto key, because if you move this screen that we've already got timed properly, it's going to fail. Go ahead and see what we got. All right, well, I need a Y there. Yeah, I lost a Y. It's going under. One, two. Oh, forgot my Y's there as well. Okay. So first we missed a Y here. Okay, just pause. Missed a Y right there. Turn my auto key back on. Go ahead and hit F. Frames all. Let's give it some height. Now he's jumping on there, riding it back and forth, leaping on. Jumps onto it, rides it underneath. Leaps, leaps. See, even this one's a little kind of. Yeah, it's a little short. Let's actually have him go here. Now that's going to throw off my next key, of course. So I'm going to need to remember, delete that key. Let's 
to then copy and paste a new one. Remember, we made duplicates. Okay, let's see then, here. stops and this is where I was missing my other Y right here in the middle and obviously that's not a very good arc there so let's go ahead I'm gonna go ahead and delete that secondary key give him a little bit more distance here Bounce. Oh, we forgot another Y right here. Okay, I'm gonna give him a little little jump like he's big jumping, little jumping, little jumping, big jump at the end. Alright, let's see what this looks like now. When we play it all back. You get the performance of just the hop. Now I must like it here. Now, again, I've got auto key on. Remember, here at the end, if I view, select camera, right at the very last key here, see? Maybe at the very end, I want to zoom in a little bit more to get that performance of that big leap to the finish line. You know? There we go, see? Big leap to finish line. And quite frankly, because I'm finishing right here at 300, guys, I'd almost give myself an extra second, so 324. Okay. Let's see what that looks like. All right, now we can have some fun here get out of this, our camera window, our actual performance camera window, as opposed to our follow camera. And now we have to think about, okay, what about certain rotations, right? Because, you know, if, if something's got a tail that's drag, so it may aim itself up going into the sky, and then when it comes back to Earth, it would be facing towards Earth. So this is a good case to kind of say, all right, what about rotations? Okay, so I'm going to come here to my original starting part. Let's go frame here and frame there. Probably going to use this one more than any of them because it's going to give us our side rotation. Okay, and what we can do here at 24, of course, is just key the rotation factors, turn our auto key back on at 24. In reality, guys, we can go all the way to the end here even and put an end key there just because we know we're going to need it eventually. Okay? So now what we're going to do, though, is we're just going to think about it, okay, that if it's, you know, le leaping, that maybe put a key just before it so I can actually rotate it just before he takes his first leap. Maybe I'll aim him up at the sky a little bit. Okay. And of course, as he's coming into squash and stretch, he's gonna kind of stay that way until he absorbs squashes, so let's go ahead and key, then he's going to rotate this way, right, as if he's going up into the air, which then, of course, as he comes in for a landing, he's going to rotate back the other way. Remember, his tail will eventually be up in the sky, so then this out right. Let's go with that. 
on to then, of course, right before he comes in, he's going to, again, swing backwards. Oops, I did too much rotation there. Let's just keep that with the correct axes. To then be, oops, let's go back a little. That. So if you think about this is what your sort of torso does when you're leaping through the air, right? And even here, he might go flat. Maybe when he goes back, he'll rotate left. Rotate light right a little bit, right? Like he's looking around. Zero out again, so he's facing forward. Figure out his, how forward is he? There he is. Oops, not that one. Going up. Just getting a little nudge here. Off again. Oh, that's right. He's on there. He's thinking again. He's back to thinking about where, which way he's going. Right? Because look here. If I go to top down here and zoom out, he's looking for this one. So maybe I'll have him turn. Let's make sure I use the correct axes. You can see I've got a lot of things with this rotate, but again, if I actually zero these things out, right, I'm just going to hit zero. See, to zero them back out again. So he's going to look this way. I'm going to have him actually follow it, kind of lead it. turn quickly to this one, right? Because that's the one he's going for. Again, he's, he should be diving towards it, right? Don't forget to do those. Zero this out. Facing his obstacle. See, he's facing the obstacle. Facing the obstacle. Facing the obstacle. Now he's about to jump. To the end platform. Let's do that so that he's now going to jump up. Did I do that backwards? No. I think I did that backwards. Yes. Here, and remember when he's coming in for a landing, he's coming in for a landing this way. Here, he's going to quickly leap. And then come in for a landing that way. To then leap. Come in for a landing that way. Leap. 
shopping. Landing. Leaping again. All right, we don't have any feet, so we have to improvise what the legs and the feet would be doing. And right about here, let's have him rotate to yeah, kind of dive bomb into this flag. And then, I don't know, we could have him come in here. I don't like him there. I like that. Let's see if that works. So now we added the rotation of the character. All right, so we've got the translation, X, Y, Z movement. We've got the beginnings of some rotations put in there. We, might, we can always add more. Let's think about now squash and stretch, okay? Now you notice here, when I move to the squash and stretch factor, which is only translate Y, I don't see my key. So I have to go based upon what it's doing in the performance. This is where I'm going to use my follow camera, okay? Follow camera is going to give me the best view of what's going on. See? So it looks like it takes off here at, okay, right here. 24 is when he starts to jump. Okay? So what I'm going to do here is put a key on my translate Y and just give it really no movement at all. I'm going to go back in time, a couple frames. Give it a little squash. Back a few frames more, a little height. Back a few frames more, just put this to zero. Okay, so he's kind of breathing, see? One, two. More, and then he launches. When you launch, you can kind of give them that stretch. Now, that stretch, though, only lasts so long until he lands again, which is right about here. So that's going to be another squash. Not to mention, okay, so he's going off, but he's also squashing too fast. So let's go back a few frames and just put this to zero, right? Because when you're flying through midair, you're not necessarily all stretched. Hit collide, do another stretch. By the time you're coming back to Earth, that should be back to zero again until you hit the ground and you recoil. back to stretch, to back to zero, to back to land. Back to, to back to stretch, to back to zero. Okay. Back to Here, he's just going to ride this for a little bit, so we'll just go to zero. Until he's about to take off right there. And that's where we're going to do a couple keys. Zero. Keys. Oh. Now, that 
it's a little bit off. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to cut that key and go back a frame. Because I want him to not only squash before he takes off here, like that. Go a little frame between and give him a little up. So again, he's kind of, before he takes a jump, he's stretching up. See? And then he's able to squash stretch. Back to zero until he hits the ground. Which again, he's going to think here, looking around. Right about here. Key selected is where he's going to again go up a little, go down a little, and then stretch up. Back to zero. Down. Back to zero, and now what? Now he's about to go under the tunnel here. So remember, we almost went or under this little sliver here. So let's just keep it. You know what? I'm going to go up a little here to exaggerate it. Let's go down a lot to exaggerate that. Key to hold this, right? We don't want it to start going back to normal until he's passed. Have him come up. Back to zero. Now that tells me there there's a little bit of weirdness going on. I might have to actually go back and just find the Y key here. And see if I can't have it be a little bit higher. Oops. See here. Now, another cool way you can do this is you can. I'm holding my middle mouse button and just scrubbing. See? And that gets me to, let's say, negative 0 0.44, 0 0.42. I don't really. Like... Now, again, this may not show up in the full size video, too. You see, now he's going to ride it. Before he takes off here, grab this here, he selected, go a little forward, squishing, he's coming in for a landing, back to zero. Now you can see my rotation might need to be cleaned up a little bit there. These are going to happen. These squash and stretches are going to happen. Just remember, when he's falling back to earth, he doesn't need to be stretched. And again, he's flying through the air here. He doesn't have to be stretched out until he comes in for the landing, which really doesn't need to have any squash and stretch. All right, let's check out the squash and stretch now in our performance or our perspective camera as we set it up. So 
you can see now we've got the squash and stretch. Now, just for F your information when it comes time to even testing this little play blast, we could also play around with these show factors because you see I've got all of these controllers for animating. They're actually just curves. So if we'd say show and turn off the NURBS curves, you see it actually gets rid of it. Let's see, I can even take off my wireframe shading to see what this performance looks like now. So we don't have to see that in the play blast. Now those won't render, okay? So you see now I've gotten the performance. It's still very stiff, but the ball is controlling the movement. The tail will follow. And just like we've been doing before with the squash and stretch, timing it based upon where he is in the air or on the ground, you're going to control the rotation of that tail or components of that tail the same way so that it is when he's falling, right, it's curled up. And when he's leaping, it's curled down, but only after he has taken off. So it's it's secondary action. The movement of that tail, of that tail rather, is always offset. It doesn't happen. So again, squash and strap, stretch happened a lot when the beats hit the ground or when he was actually in the air. The tail moves slightly off that. All right, let's have some fun. Let's go back to our beginning. Space bar. I'm going to get here. I'm just going to work with these guys. And I'm going to show you a shortcut here now. And so I'm going to select in order. these controllers. Let me select them. Okay, so I'm going to select the first and the tail, then the next one, next one, and next one. And hit the E to get our rotation. You can see what this will do, though. This will actually allow me to animate this all at the same time, kind of like the tip of a finger. Okay? So I could come here, right? Click right key, auto key is on. Now again, I could do this from the side, or maybe this would be a good time to use my, again, my follow cam. Okay, and this is X, Y, and Z. So I can go right, I can go left. He's about to take off. So at 24, I will go and hit zero here, because I'm still, right? And let's go with, okay, so he's leaping, right? He's leaping into the air. So again, the tail gets left behind. Only after he's gone past his apex does the tail go up. Okay. I'm actually going to give this a little more up wiggle. up when he's falling after he's hit the ground that tail does not fall back down until he's already taking off okay see? it has to happen secondary as he comes falling back down now it's now going to fly back up as he's on his way down to earth right it doesn't go back down until he's already in the air it doesn't come back up until he's already taken off from the ground. See, and if I need to, guys, I can always just hit zero here to zero it out to make sure I'm using the correct one. Hit air. Now that key there is a little late, so I'm just going to take it. Cut it, paste it back, right angle here. Let's put this back to zero. There we 
go. Now, see, he's just riding this back and forth here, so I could really just kind of zero that value out. Maybe give a little wag, a wag that way, a little wag this way. Go ahead and zero it. He's now about to leap, which means it will actually have a little bit of lag. See? Up a little, he'll take off. Again, at the apex, that will be down until he comes in for a landing. And then it'll be up. Okay, now he's looking around again, so let's just zero it out. thinking. I'm just adding some simple rotational thinking moments here. And again, even when he squashes guys, see, it's almost when he's up squash, his tail's down. And when he flattens, his tail goes up. Tail down, up in the air, just before he lands, is when that tail's up in the air. And just before he squashes, right, he has to squash first before his tail actually comes down. Let's just zero it out here a second as he goes underneath. So it almost behaves like a whole other element of the character. Falling back to earth right before he lands, tail up. When he hits, before he leaps, before he comes back to earth, before he hits, down. Key, that key. Up, coming back down. And it almost stays up while he's squashing because it doesn't come back down until he stretches and leaps. That's when it goes down again. See how that looks now that we've added the tail. Space bar, fine, play. And now look at that extra secondary motion. See? It gives it that extra weight of that slightly lagging behind moment until he reaches his goal. All right, so some other cool things to think about what we could play with here, guys, just really quickly. Besides, again, remember we set the settings, so it's 1920 by 1080, which is why we're looking at our screen. We're going to render out the perspective window. If you ever want to double check 
you can actually go to your renderable camera section. See? And it currently says renderable camera is perspective. Okay? Not the follow camera. We don't really need the follow camera. We just used it so we could actually follow along without messing up the animated camera, the keyframe camera, which is designating now exactly the beginning, middle, and end of ours. You know, I can come here and I can do name underscore extended. I can give it an end frame, oops, which is actually 324 instead of 300. Okay. Uh, I would probably want to do a Targa sequence, okay, as opposed to an AVI, just because if I'm rendering, I really want a Targa sequence and I can use After Effects together. Remember, guys, when you do a Play Blast, you are running into the issue and problem of. Um, Let's add motion blur, why not? Maya soft. Okay, so I'm not doing fancy Arnold here. Um, but uh, what you don't want to do if you do a play blast, like I've said before, is if we do a window and we do a play blast, okay? It is going to save that play blast on my particular machine, especially, it saves it as an AVI uncompressed. And that might be fine and dandy because it's a pretty good quality and all. Problem is, it might be at 320 frames, that could be a gigabyte. So if you, you know, stop with the AVIs. You can convert it to another format using After Effects, or Media Encoder. So you see, here's my Play Blast. And that works great and fine in terms of the performance of a Play Blast. But what do we do if we actually want to have some fun here with this? Okay, so watch what I'm going to do here. Okay? I'm going to go to import. I don't know if you remember the last tutorial I did, which was under not the obstacle. It was under heavy versus light, under scenes. I saved the lighting, right? So I could just import my lighting scenario here, activate my lights here. Now be careful because I've got auto key and I'm in my perspective. Okay, we want to make sure that. I don't, with the auto key on, so turn off that auto key, but now I can come through and I can look at my performance with my lighting from another scene I built. Now, this might take a little bit of adjustment with, yeah, I've also got motion blur on, it's a little dark. So let's come here and go to my lighting group. Open the attribute editor, make it a little bit brighter little wider can't there we go I kind of like that see with a wider angle on it own angle let's go to my point light here maybe add its brightness up a little bit my directional give it a little more intensity okay and what if I want to do a little bit more here even with my set with my obstacle course okay well you can see what makes up the ball you know the tail ball colors that are already in here and you notice that there's just a bunch of other junk in here that isn't really being used necessarily so I'm just gonna make in order to get my uh, uh, obstacle course to show up a little bit let's just go ahead and make a new blend okay and with this blend here I don't have to do a lot here I could probably turn on my ray tracing just because I like the way that looks okay in the color let's have some fun with this let's go with a checker all right, but instead of doing a bright white and black checker, let's just make a, a bright white and blue checker, okay? Now the question is, though, is how do we now get this checker we just created onto our uh, obstacle course? Well, the obstacle course, I believe, is all built from a Lambert. So watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to right-click on the Lambert, and I'm going to select objects, with this shading group. And that should select the entire uh, obstacle course. I can then right click on my checker one and assign it to it. Now, it may not let us do it necessarily because remember in our layers, it is currently in reference, which means it won't let us select it. So let's turn off the reference. Let's try it again. Okay. Select objects. Sign material. Oh, what is that made out of then? Let's see. What is that made out of? Well, that's made out of Fong 10. All right. Well, we can 
actually assign it that way. And you see how we get the checkers to kind of show up. Just another way of doing it. You can see, oops, minimize there for a second. Now what's curious you're seeing here though is that because this obstacle course was kind of built, in fact, this is a great idea, just get out of perspective a second. It's just bad news to be in this. Although I do have my auto cue off, so it really wouldn't matter because it's not actually going to move my camera. But when we made the obstacle course, it didn't follow. You see, it's been deformed but not re remapped. Well, this is a good way to kind of, how do we actually remap? Well, we can go to UV, just right here, and just say automatic. See that? And then I can select each of these here, G, G. Somehow I got in out of object mode here. So I'm just selecting those geometries and just assigning them with my checker. But if you want it to be proper with these, you need to actually do an automatic mapping. But that tag member you have to do, when you do that, you have to get F8 to get back to object mode. And the automatic mapping is just going to apply those textures as it's at best sees fit. Now, curious with that though, spacebar. See now I've got my checkerboards. Go ahead and go to our main camera here. Come on. Okay. If we want to change these. Okay, you see, if I want to make, say, more checkers, the best way to probably do that without getting into the whole idea of unwrapping is you could actually go to the checkerboard section here with the attribute editor for it. See? And it will actually give me the ability here of increasing or decreasing uh, place 2D texture. See this? And this is where I could say, hey, repeat 8 by 8 instead of 4 by 4. And that gives me more checkers. Again, not a really big deal. Let's go ahead and save this. I haven't saved it yet. So it's actually saved it as the obstacle course. So be careful of that. Because remember, I opened the scene file of obstacle course. So this is where when we want to do the render settings or something, I might want to come in here under my common settings here and give it the proper sequence name. Let's just do this. Let's do last name obstacle. Okay? So we've got our render settings. We've got some lighting in here. We've got some textures created for us. Things should look pretty good. I've even got motion blur set up to actually work. So let's go ahead and turn those off in here so we actually get a little better performance. Do that. And to finally render, all I need to do is switch to the render settings, render ring, render, batch render, and that will now create the sequence of images that I need to then put together as an MPEG for H.264 in Adobe Premiere, uh, After Effects, or even Media Encoder. So I'm going to let this render out. Let's see. Let's see. Maybe it'll give, it'll give us one image by the time. You see, it's actually going pretty quick. It's mostly because there's no motion but a reactive right now, but it's going pretty quick. Let's see what this would look like as a sequence. View the sequence. There it is right there. Open. And that's what the final render will basically look like. And you can almost see this is already moving over here. Even though we've only got a few frames done. It's open. I like this little F check way of looking at the world. Where we need to 
go though is animation. I want to go to Tampa. Come on. Scroll ball obstacle. Obstacle project. This again renders into the images folder. There it is right there. I can hit open. And now you'll see it's actually given me nine, ten frames. Yeah, so you can start to see the performance. Now it looks like there's some weird stuff going on here with the textures that were on the squirrel ball. That might be something to actually look into, but you see because we turned on ray tracing, we got reflections. Yeah, it looks like it's got uh, something wrong with the, uh, the texture on our squirrel ball. That might be something that you want to replace as well because it looks like it's almost looks like the normals or the transparency setting on that texture is off. See, there, here's the texture. Oh, transparency, you can see. I don't know. So, between the uh, rendering process of creating your H264, or if you do a play blast, that'd be perfectly fine as well. I hope you guys have some good time with this. I'm gonna let this render out and try to put it together and actually maybe include it, the final version into the assignment uh, tutorial, which I'll have uploaded as soon as I can. Thank you guys and have yourself a great week.